Welcome to this short lecture on space, place, and community development. This lecture is meant to be complementary to the book chapter titled Space, Place, and Community Development in the textbook Community Development Applications for Leisure, Sport, and Tourism. So our objectives for this short lecture is first to distinguish between the ideas of space and place, second to problemize the idea of public space and talk about how the quality of public space can have a big influence on how that space can be used for community development. And finally, to review two frameworks that help us think about how spaces can be used for community development and how we can think about making spaces better or more conducive to community development. So first we have the idea of space. When we say space, we're referring to the absolute dimension of a geographic or physical location. So spaces are objective and measurable. So for example, the room you're in could be 10 feet by 11 feet with an eight foot ceiling. The desk space that you work at may be one meter by a half a meter. These are all the very physical, objective, measurable aspects of a space. And spaces can be big or they can be small. They can be large like a park or a neighborhood or small like your desk space or a room in a building. Places, on the other hand, are a relative dimension. They're about the meaning that we give to spaces. Places are subjective, perceived, and socially constructed. They're the meanings that we associate with a space based on the experiences that we've had or the way we've interacted with others within a particular space. So what this means is that a single space can actually be many places or a space can hold many different meanings for different people. So for example, if you grew up playing hockey, the smell of a hockey arena might bring you fond memories of friendship and play and success that you've experienced in your life. If you didn't grow up playing hockey, the smell of a hockey arena may make you think that this is just a dank old place that people don't take care of and that may not bring any positive meaning or good feelings about that space. On the flip side, if you grew up playing hockey and perhaps it wasn't a positive experience, perhaps you were bullied or injured while you were playing, that space may hold a negative meaning. So the same space, the same physical spaces with objective characteristics can hold many meaning for different people based on the experiences that they've had and the interactions that they've had that will construct the meaning of that place. Now, when we talk about community development, it's important to distinguish the types of spaces and places that we're talking about. One common um, term that's used is this idea of third places. And third places are important for community development because they're the places in which leisure takes place, the places in which people choose to engage in um, in these positive social activities that help them build their ideas of community or, or places. So Oldenburg coined the term third places as places that are away from both home and work, but where people regularly come together and gather to engage in fun, voluntary, and informal activities. These can be a variety of places, so places like community centers, um, that are that are public or owned by public organizations and meant for everyone but they can also be private spaces like pubs or coffee shops or gyms where people go that isn't home and isn't work but they go to engage with other people to be social um, and to build these meanings and ideas of community one of the kind of key aspects of third places is the idea of sociability meaning that it's a place people go purely for the social aspects, purely to engage with others, to build these meanings um, and 
build a sense of community. Um, and these ideas of sociability mean that these places, these third places, are typically happy, welcoming, lighthearted, um, and positive spaces to be in. Now to build on this, we need to think really critically about what we mean when we say public space. So often we think of public spaces as spaces that are accessible to everyone or that are meant for everyone's use. So we might think of places like a community center or a public park. However, the public aspect of these spaces should, should be looked at kind of critically and thought about rather critically. Because not all public spaces or places that we may consider to be public are actually accessible and welcoming for people. And in fact, we put a lot of rules and regulations on how we're able to use public spaces. It's quite common for us to ban things like hanging out or um, consuming alcohol in certain spaces. We even go to great lengths to ban things like skateboarding or playing um, sports in different public spaces. So the idea of ownership or who owns a space isn't necessarily the only thing that makes it public. Similarly, people who may not feel welcome or safe in a space may not consider that space to feel very public or welcoming. So for example, if you have a small playground where groups of mothers bring their small kids to hang out and play quite regularly and they dominate that space. If you're a young teenager who wants to hang out with your friends, you may not feel like that space is very public or accessible to you if you're constantly being um, overwatched by these, these groups of mothers who are hypervigilant. So what this means is the quality of public spaces or the potential of that space to engender or encourage community development is based on a variety of factors or characteristics which are more related to accessibilities and perceptions of what we think about it than it is to the actual ownership of the space. And it's important to note here that in our current kind of sociocultural context that public spaces are becoming less and less common and as a result community development becomes more and more difficult. So through things like capitalism, privatization, and neoliberalism, we've seen these kind of eroding or rolling back of public infrastructures. And as a result of the public spaces where people go to engage in leisure activities, to be social and to build these sense of communities. We've talked about this in other classes when we talk about um, the physical spaces of um, suburban communities that are much more um, focused on the private space and the owning of space as opposed to the public spaces that we see in more urban or rural contexts. So moving forward, I wanna talk about um, some of these characteristics and what they mean. And we're gonna review two frameworks for thinking about how spaces can be leveraged or improved for community development outcomes. The first is eight design principles proposed by Mean and Tims. These are principles which we can use when we're thinking about how spaces can be created in order to foster sociability or community development. We could call these rules of engagement for spaces. The first is access and availability. So in order for community development to take place in spaces, there needs to be a range of publicly accessible and available spaces. And we need to think about the ways that we can reduce barriers to engaging in these spaces and to being social in these spaces. The second is invitations from peers and others. So in order for these spaces to be used for community development, people need to be aware of the space and encouraging us to use the space. We need to have people in the spaces who are inviting others to come in and who are really trying to make this space work for community development. Third is exchange-based relationships. So people will interact in spaces for a variety of reasons and often these are very 
purposeful reasons. There are people have reasons to go there, to make exchanges, to learn things, um, to make connections, which they can use in other places as well. So successful public spaces effectively enable those exchanges to happen. Fourth, we have both visible and invisible choreography. What this means is things need to happen in these spaces. People need to be engaging and doing different things in order to enable the community development processes to take place. These can be visible things, so things like a programmer who works in a space and their purpose in being in the space is to bring people together. And it can also be unofficial or invisible, so things that happen more organically. Fifth, we have a diversity of activities and people. So in order to foster these ideas of community development, we can't have a singular type of person using the space. It can't be only for one type of people. So in the example I used before, it can't be only mothers and young children. We need a diversity of people and activities happening in the space so that people can feel like it's welcome and open for many different types of people. It's also important for spaces to be networked, which means they're not standalone and completely solitary, but rather connected to other public spaces and places. Props refers to the things that we see in the space. So similar to the diversity of people and activities who are engaged in the space, different props, so things like recreational equipment or baby strollers, um, or maybe blankets for people having a picnic. These props indicate to people that different activities are invited and welcome in the space. So props play an important role in signaling to us how welcoming or accessible the space is and to who it is welcoming or accessible to. And finally, safety. People need to feel safe in spaces in order to engage and interact. But this one should be engaged with a word of caution because safety is often invoked or used as a way to justify privatization. So saying that privatizing something, we can then control who comes into it and then who is in that space will determine how safe it is. Rather, we need to think about fostering safe spaces for everyone and safety in a more public sense. The second framework we'll review um, is for the, from the Project for Public Spaces. Um, and this framework um, allows us to really illustrate some of these characteristics of public spaces and help planners and community organizers to think about the different ways that we can make spaces um, more useful or encouraging of community development. So you see the framework here is color-coded with a bunch of different characteristics um, and these colors refer to different things. So some are measurements, so things we can measure like traffic data, transit usage, property values. Others are more intangible things, um, so characteristics like um, places being useful, places being active, um, places being close to others and connected. And finally, we have the key attributes in the middle. So these key attributes are the sociability of the space, the uses and activities that can happen, the comfort and image of the space, and the access and the way that it's linked. And these key attributes are then um, make the framework for the intangible and measure, measurable or tangible characteristics of the space. So this, this framework is useful for community organizers because you can take a space, like say your, your public park, for example, and you can look at these different characteristics, organize around these key attributes, and think about ways that you could improve the quality of your space or how you could leverage that space better for community development outcomes. So in summary, to wrap this up, it's important to remember that spaces are measurable and places are meaningful, which means that one space can be many places and can hold many different meanings for different people. When we think about spaces and particularly public spaces, we need to think critically about that and recognize that public space and the quality of public space is determined by more than just ownership. 
We also need to consider the variety of factors that contribute to the quality of spaces and how spaces can then be used for community development. And we saw those two frameworks for thinking in a really kind of tangible action oriented way as to how we can better use spaces for community development. To wrap this up, I just have a series of reflective questions for you to think about. First, if you think about the space you're in right now, how would you describe that space? And how would you describe the place that it is to you? Second, can you think of a space that holds different meaning for you and someone else? And can you explain why these meanings might be different? Third, what third spaces are important in your community and why? And finally, what public spaces can you think of that aren't necessarily high quality or high potential to lead to community development outcomes? Based on the frameworks and design principles we reviewed, how could you possibly improve them and make them more useful or encouraging of community development? Thanks for checking in, and we'll talk to you again soon.